almost four years ago, I began using Anki with the intent of improving my vocabulary in both Spanish and Mandarin. With both vocabulary and audio sentence cards, my language abilities have substantially increased, and I don't regret my decision. Given the versatility and power of this application, I couldn't help but use it for other subjects as well, not just languages. Over the years, I tinkered around with creating my own decks for college classes, such as statistics and computer science, but there was a glaring issue. The information in these self-made decks never stuck. I always ended up suspending or deleting the cards after a couple weeks because I kept failing them, never being able to remember the answers. How is it possible to be so good at making cards for language learning that they could last a year, but so bad at making cards for every other subject that they couldn't even last a month? Then I realized, this has nothing to do with Anki or flashcards. The deeper issue has to do with how I learn new things in general. Outside of the classroom, I figured out how to learn languages on my own, but I never figured out how to learn other subjects on my own. After many eureka moments, I can finally retain information in a wide range of subjects, such as history, physics, finance, psychology, computer science, quotes, popular classical song names, and even Excel functions. In school, you learn concepts in just about every subject, but you don't learn the most important concept of all, how to learn. Learning versus memorization. What's the most resilient parasite? A bacteria? A virus? An intestinal worm? An idea. Resilient, highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold in the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. A person can cover it up, ignore it, but it stays there. But surely, to forget? Information, yes. But an idea? Fully formed? Understood? That sticks. Regardless of what you're studying, learning and memorization are different things. Learning is easy, while memorization is hard. If you're trying to cram it into your head, you're doing it wrong. True learning is so effortless that you don't even realize that you're learning, and in fact the information is hard to forget. Here's a couple of shifts in your way of thinking that will make the information stick easier. Why versus what. Let's say that you're in math class, and the teacher tells you that 0 divided by 0 is undefined. That information will be on the test, so you better remember it. But instead of cramming it into your head, you could learn it by asking the simple question, why? Why is 0 divided by 0 undefined? What's any number divided by itself? Whether it's 5 over 5, negative 200 over negative 200, or pi over pi, the answer will always be 1. That means that 0 over 0 should also equal 1. However, what's 0 divided by any number? Whether it's 0 over 5, 0 over negative 200, or 0 over pi, the answer will always be 0. That means that 0 over 0 should also equal 0. Now hold your horses. Both of these can't be true at the same time which is precisely why 0 over 0 is undefined. Don't ask what. Ask why, because understanding the why is easier to understand than the what. Real world versus abstract. Years ago, I tried putting statistics equations on my Anki cards and brute forcing them into my head, but I could never explain the concepts behind the formulas. When studying material that has complex language and abstract concepts, you end up memorizing the material instead of learning it. That's why I'm a proponent of using real world applications and analogies when possible. If you're watching this, chances are you've passed high school biology. Remember the popular saying, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell? It's such a memorable phrase because it's a real-world analogy in simple language, not some complicated biology gibberish. Here's some other examples. Suppose you're in computer science class and learning about the convex hull. Wikipedia defines a convex hull either as intersection of all convex sets containing a given subset of Euclidean space, or equivalently, as a set of all convex combinations of points in the subset. It's possible for me to memorize every single word of a sentence without actually understanding what it means. A real-life analogy of a convex hole is wrapping a rubber band around a set of points. Now that's a simple explanation, but how is this concept even important in real life? Why am I even learning it in the first place? Well, a real-world application is collision detection in video games. Calculating the exact hitbox of an object in a video game takes a lot of resources, so calculating a simple hitbox using the convex hole is a lot more efficient and takes fewer resources. Suppose you're in psychology class and you're learning about the gambler's fallacy. It's the incorrect belief that if an event happens more frequently in the past, then it'll happen less frequently in the future, even when there's no correlation. I guess I understand, but what's a real-world example? The popular Chinese anime Scissor 7 has a character who reminds me of this fallacy. There is a guy who has 13 children, and all of them are girls. The gambler's fallacy is a belief that the next child is more likely to be a boy, even though it's still obviously just a coin flip. How could the gender of previous children affect the gender of future children? Suppose you're in physics class and learning about thermal expansion. When a material heats up, generally it will expand. Now physics is about as real world as it gets, but what are some real life examples of having to account for thermal expansion? Why is it important? 
Well, have you ever wondered why there's cracks every few feet in the sidewalk? It's because the concrete expands and contracts throughout the day and throughout the seasons, and it needs space to do so. Note-taking is a distraction. The phrase time equals money is quite a popular one, and even though I'd heard it, I never truly understood it until college. Guess which class helped me understand it? Math? Economics? Nope, it was actually English class. My English professor, out of all people, was explaining why he chose to pay for YouTube Premium instead of choosing to watch ads. Being a professor, he stated that he would get paid more per hour than let's say a cashier would per hour. It was through that real-life analogy that I understood how people exchange their time for money, so time equals money. Additionally, he went through some napkin math, saying that if he watched X hours of YouTube every single day and had to watch X minutes of ads from that, then it would be more cost-effective for him to just pay YouTube the subscription to get rid of the ads. In other words, it literally wasn't worth his time to watch the ads. Now, how did I learn this concept in class? Did I take handwritten notes? Did I take a picture of the board? Did I use Anki cards? The answer is nothing. I took no notes in that class at all, yet over five years later, I can still give the explanation behind that concept. How is that even possible? Suppose that you're in class and intensely focused on copying down everything that's on the slides or on the board. It felt like you learned a lot, but do you even remember what the professor was saying? Did you even pay attention to them? What's the point of having a walking, talking chatbot there, specifically trained in that field, if you're just going to tune them out and mindlessly copy down information? The way it's traditionally done, note-taking is a distraction from the professor's real-life examples and simplified explanations. After all, blindly copying down something is deceiving yourself that you're learning it. At the very best, it's brute force memorization that you will forget as soon as class is over. If you take fewer or no notes and actually pay attention to what the professor is saying, it'll be obvious what you're not understanding, and that'll lead you to ask more questions and ensure that you actually know the material. How to learn. Keep asking questions until you understand. Sometimes I watch Xiaolin Shuo's videos on economics and finance. The English for this video means something along the lines of how I quickly learn a field of study. She drew out this complicated financial diagram of the economy, and that's when everything clicked. It was a logic of repeatedly asking why this, because that, that made it clear that you have to keep asking questions until you understand. I like reading information on random topics, getting myself into rabbit holes, and making Anki cards on that information. The material ranges from a curiosity stream documentary on barcodes, a college textbook on the study of algorithms, an online website about privacy, a Khan Academy video on geometry, and a list of all the suspicious things that Google has done. The learning method that universally works for me is called the Feynman Technique. It's often said that you don't understand something unless you could explain it to someone else. The Feynman technique consists of teaching the information to someone else, preferably to a child or someone who knows nothing about the subject, and this forces you to use simple language. It alerts you of the gaps in your knowledge, encouraging you to study more and fill in those gaps. Rinse and repeat. Now how would it look like in real life? Let's say you're watching a documentary on CuriosityStream, not sponsored, and you're learning about the history of the barcode. Barcodes were invented because cashiers manually typing in prices took too much time, and people were getting fed up. The lines of a barcode mean... Huh. What do the lines mean? I'm discovering that it's only the width of the lines that contains the information, not the height. The height is only to make the area big enough for the scanner to read. The thickness of the lines is a secret code that only the cashier scanner can read. The code is read from left to... Wait a minute. If the cashier scans it upside down, how does the scanner know to internally flip the barcode? I'm discovering that scanners were designed to account for this because the original circular barcodes- Wait, what? Barcodes used to be circular, only becoming rectangular in the 1970s? Okay, barcodes used to be circular because the information could be easily read no matter what the orientation was. They changed to rectangles because... Wait, why did barcodes change to rectangles? Sounds like the circular version was superior. I'm discovering that you could fit more information in a smaller area, which is why the rectangular version was better. If you want to master something, Teach it. Richard Feynman. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Albert Einstein. The proof of a high education is the ability to speak about complex matters as simply as possible. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Top tier ChatGPT prompts. Chatbots such as ChatGPT are indispensable when it comes to learning something with no outside help. I highly recommend asking a real life analogy or example for whatever you're trying to learn. This is essentially asking the why as opposed to the what. For example, I was studying binary search trees in computer science class. They seemed pretty boring at first, but they became a lot more interesting when you discovered that autocorrect actually uses them to determine whether the word you typed is spelled correctly or not. Another fantastic prompt is to ask it to explain something to you as if you were 12 years old. I've learned many financial terms like bonds and dividends through this method. What do my cards actually look like? All my non-language learning cards that are self-made cover history, 
physics, finance, psychology, computer science, quotes, popular classical song names, and even Excel functions. All of them are closed cards, which hide a specific section of the card, and multiple cards can be automatically created out of a single card by selecting different parts. Closing an entire phrase or sentence might seem hard to memorize, but I'm not trying to memorize, I'm trying to learn. The wording of an idea can be different, while the general base idea is the same. Earlier in this video, I mentioned that learning and memorization are not the same things, which is that learning is easy and memorization is hard. This doesn't mean that I don't memorize information though. Take famous classical music for example. There are three closed sections, the composer's name, the song name, and the audio file for that song. Chunking the card into three separate cards helps even though it's still brute force memorization and there are no real world examples or analogies. By the way, guess what I use for extracting audio clips out of YouTube videos for this? All my non-language learning cards that are pre-made decks that I downloaded are memorized through brute force memorization. To maintain my geography knowledge, I have pre-made decks for the regions of different countries. On the website geogester.com slash I used to be able to do the individual regions of each country in continental North, Central, and South America with maybe a 90% average score on hard mode for each one. Since I never practice every day, Ange cards seem like a good way to prevent me from getting rusty. If I'm memorizing the regions of a new country, then I'll use geogastro.com sasatira to break it into my head, and after that I'll use Anki to sort of sustain my knowledge. There's also this massive Latin and Greek roots deck I review, and even though it's technically memorization, there are example words that contain the root prefix or suffix, so that helps. How I review cards. I used to be demotivated from using Anki, which you can find more about in this video, or this one, I don't know which corner it is. After I realized just to make fewer cards, reviewing everything still takes about 15 to 30 minutes every single day. The way I made reviewing Anki cards more fun is by putting everything in a parent deck and then reviewing that. This randomizes which subdecks are chosen, and the randomness really makes things more fun, but mileage may vary. Why do I learn new things? The information age. We currently live in a time period where the most amount of collective human knowledge can be accessed at our fingertips nearly instantaneously. Those of the past could only dream of the knowledge that we have access to nowadays, but despite that, we don't even use it to its full extent. Imagine time traveling 300 years into the past and telling people about these magical flying devices called airplanes. You could travel from New York to London in hours, not weeks or months. The average person could also afford to ride it. They ask you, so how does an airplane work? You respond, I don't know, magic I guess. Similarly, imagine time traveling 300 years into the future, and by this time we've invented these teleporters, where anyone can get inside this elevator sized box and be teleported anywhere in the world in an instant. You're fascinated by it, and you ask everyone around you, so how do teleporters work? They'll respond, oh, I don't know, magic I guess. Digital amnesia, also known as the Google effect, has become more and more prevalent with the advent of the internet. It's a tendency to forget information when you know that you can easily find it online. Knowing that the answer is online means that you're less likely to know it by heart. Do you know family and friends' phone numbers off the top of your head anymore? Would you be able to fix the engine of your car when you're stranded out in the middle of nowhere with no cell signal? Are you able to communicate with foreigners without having to rely on Google Translate? Are we just nothing without the internet nowadays? We have no excuse for not being smarter than the previous generation. The next time you don't know something, your immediate reaction shouldn't be, I'll just Google it, or I'll just ask ChatGPT. Deeply ponder the question without the internet, and that'll make you realize how dependent you are on the internet. But I'm nothing without the internet. If you're nothing without the internet, then you shouldn't have it. Money makers or problem solvers. James Janney is one of my favorite YouTubers of all time. His content is very similar to that of Vsauce, Let Me Know, and Quotesquazart. They rarely upload, but when they do, the videos go viral to compensate. Years ago, I saw his video called The Untold Truth About Money, How to Build Wealth from Nothing, and I still think about it from time to time. I promise, it's not one of those scammy get rich quick style of videos. The simple message I got is that people make money by solving problems. The invention of Morse code solved the problem of not being able to send messages to people far away. The dimension of the car solved the problem of it taking too long to get from place to place. The invention of the zipper solved the problem of spending an eternity to button and unbutton a piece of clothing. Even the Chrome extension and sentence mining script that I created were created to solve the problem that I had. So what does problem solving have to do with learning? Well, in order to solve a problem, firstly, you have to know that the problem exists, and secondly, you have to know how to solve the problem. Both require learning new things. Every time someone says, I wish, you should pay attention because that's a potential problem that could be solved. Every time you say I wish, think about how many other people have that problem as well. Where did all the years go? It's often said that life seems to speed up as you get older. Where did all the years go? Well, when you're a kid, you're constantly learning new things, meeting new people, and having new experiences. As you age though, 
you settle into a daily routine, have a 9-to-5 job, and generally do the same thing every single day. In order to make life feel like it's going by more slowly, make each day unique and create new memories. One of the reasons I always learn new things is because it's easy to measure progress. This fills my life up with more events, creating the illusion that time is going by more slowly. When will I stop using Anki? Before I started using Anki for non-language learning information, I was already firm in my decision to use it for a long period of time, because over the course of my life, I want to learn multiple languages to high levels using Anki. Now that I've started using Anki for non-language learning information, it's morphed into the sort of note-taking app and second brain. The idea of using Anki every single day and having a streak that spans decades excites me, but I shouldn't make any promises just yet. The end of history illusion is a psychological phenomenon where people tend to think that they've reached their final self, and they underestimate how much that they'll change in the future. It's easy for me right now to think that I'll be using Anki in 5 or 10 years, but really, who knows? Thanks for watching. I've been writing the script for this video for about 3 months, so I'd appreciate it if you dropped a like and shared it with others if you think that they'd find it useful as well. See you in the next video. Wikipedia defines a convex hole either as the intersection of all convex sets containing a given subset of a Euclidean space, or equivalent, or equivalent, either as the intersection of all convex sets containing a given. After all, blindlessly, blindlessly. That's a new word. In order to make life feel like it's going by more slowly, make each, make each.